presentation of the AMCO Pan-African Groundwater Program. My name is Ramon Brentzel. I'm from the Federal Institution of Geoscience and Natural Resources, uh, which is called shortly PGR of Germany. And uh, I have the honor today to um, lead you through this session. Um, before we start the session, I would like to introduce uh, you to the speakers. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, um, we have Professor Moshut Tijani. He is a groundwater desk officer of AMCAO. Uh, then we have Seifu Kebere Gourmesa, so professor for hydrology at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Dimitri Potsi Daev, uh, Global Advisor for Government Finance uh, from the United Nations Capital Development Fund uh, based in Uganda. We have uh, Dr. Christina Fraser, uh, Fraser, researcher at the Institute of Groundwater Assessment Center, or the International Groundwater Assessment Center, sorry. Uh, we have Bertram Schwartz, Deputy Director of Geohydrology. Uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform in Namibia, and uh, Dr. Yusuf Kivala, Lecturer for Finance and Corporate Strategy at the Makerere University in Uganda. Before we start with the presentations, um, um, I'd like to ask Mr. Thomas Banner, he's a pro, uh, Visional Executive Secretary of AMCAO, uh, to open the session. Please, uh, Thomas, go ahead. Thank you very much, moderator. Good afternoon, friends of AMCO and supporters of the African AMCO Pan African Groundwater Program, uh, the conveners and co conveners, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you to this AMCO Groundwater session tagged AMCO Groundwater Program, spearheading a vision on groundwater resilience in Africa. As we all know, Water security generally imply availability of acceptable quantity and quality of water for human health and livelihoods, ecosystems and production, while ensuring limited or acceptable water related risks to people and environments. Despite the large volume of water stored underground in Africa, estimated at uh, 20 times to be 20 times more than the fresh water stored in lakes and reservoirs, achieving water security for Africa presents a challenge due to increasing pressures on water resources related to population growth, the rising living standards, land use, uh, land use change, and most importantly, climate change. Groundwater is contributing and we will continue to contribute significantly to meet the increasing demand for water, for domestic supply in the African continent. It also contributes significantly to water demands in other sectors like food production and industry and serve as resilient buffer against climate extremes in African continent. By and large, Effective and sustainable management is required to sustain the important roles of groundwater, most importantly in transboundary situations, in realizing the water-related SDG targets and broader inclusive development. Therefore, the key call for action is to support AMCO's Pan-African Groundwater Program to strengthen understanding of pathways for enhancing information, data, and knowledge base, and capacity building in effective ground manage, groundwater management and governance in member states. With this background, I wish you all rewarding and fruitful deliberations while appreciating the sponsorship of PGR and supporting roles of other AMCO partners. Thank you. And I declare the session officially opened. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for highlighting the importance and uh, the potential of groundwater on the African continent. Um, and uh, also to highlight the relevance of a groundwater program on the Pan-African scale. Um, 
Our next speaker, Moshu Tijani, he is the ground for the desk officer of AMCO. He will give us now an overview about the program structure, its objectives, and its strategy. Um, yes, please, Moshu. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raymond. And I welcome all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining. I'm talking, I'm giving, using this opportunity to give us a brief overview of the AMCO groundwater program. Uh, as we all know, AMCO within, in its strategy for 2018 to 2030 has the overall goal of assuring the dignity of people of Africa by providing adequate and sustainable water services. And it also to promote, to develop and manage the utilization of water resources to assure water and food security, energy security in Africa. To effectively deliver on this commitment, AMCO identified groundwater as one of the key priority intervention area. And as a result, uh, the, the process of operationalization of the AMCO flagship program called APA Group was kickstarted in February 2020 in Kampala, Uganda. What is the APA Group? APA Group as a groundwater program aimed specifically to leverage on science and to reassert the influence of groundwater policy and practice in Africa. And the goal is to promote sustainable management and utilization of groundwater resources for water security and resilience in Africa, and to improve the quality and practice of groundwater in Africa for better lives and livelihood. So in this sphere, it means upper group is to provide continental leadership in sustainable utilization of groundwater, not only for water security, but also for food security, for water supply system, and for water resilience in the face of climate change. So, and what are the strategies and the focus of APA Group as a program of AMCO to ensure sustainable work? This, uh, the strategies and the focus is based on the three-pronged approach. We have policy governance and institutional system, system strengthening, groundwater management and resources assessment, and then we have the awareness, knowledge sharing, capacity development as another focus. Of course, the cross-cutting leverage is to leverage on science and technology to be able to ensure sustainable management and utilization of water resources in Africa. So within this framework, HAMCO and APA Group have three broad I mean, working thematic areas. And this working thematic area cut across policy, governance, and institutional strengthening country support management tool for groundwater, capacity strengthening and professionalism in drilling, groundwater knowledge hub and information sharing. We have resource assessment and aquifer management and mapping. And then we have the aspect where we are trying to see how do we increase the private and public finance in groundwater sector, which is to not uh, usually considered. And then what are the benefits of upper group in this field? We have the strategic benefit, technical and institutional benefit. And this benefit, if you look at it, they are generally member state centered. This is to drive sustainable management and utilization of groundwater resources in the member states of the African country. So we want to use to leverage on the influence of the uh, influence of governance on groundwater system in member state. We want member state to have, on the technical side, have access to best available knowledge, relevance to forge with developmental outcome and general performance. And also we want member state to be able to have access to capacity development, strengthening of groundwater management, both at regional, national, and local level. And of course, as I said earlier, there is need to also ensure that there is public and private finance into the groundwater sector. So, and what do we need in achieving all this? We need partnership. And the partnership that has already existing now, based on the work of upper group in the last one year, is that we have a significant and continued strengthening of our partnership. With the SADEC GNI, Government of Namibia, DGR, we are piloting groundwater support tool in the country are using Namibia as a, as a case study. 
Also with the UNESCO, we are developing pilot methodology for national groundwater regulation gap analysis. And then with AMCO, IMI and BGS, we are also trying to develop a white paper on groundwater to have a high level policy statement and documentation regarding groundwater utilization in Africa. Of course, we also have the BGR supporting us in partnership to have a scoping studies on the finance of in the groundwater sector. And also in, 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 in collaboration with the African Groundwater Network and other partners, we are trying to also develop a kind of online program, training program for member states, which is to enhance capacity building. And of course, we are trying to also create opportunity and platform through the AMCO Knowledge Hub, where you have a one-stop information station on groundwater issues in Africa. So with this, we, we think that moving forward, what is important and what is critical for us as AMCO at the continental level is collaboration and partnership. AMCO is properly positioned to leverage on its political leadership in ensuring the development and management of groundwater resources in Africa. However, political commitment is an institutionalization of the governance structure in groundwater management is very critical. And in this regard, partnership with international organization and infrastructural finance in groundwater sector is also very key. And with this, we are using this medium to call our partners to call our donors and interested partners to cooperate and work with AMCO so that we can drive the sustainable development, utilization, and management of groundwater resources in Africa. With this, I want to thank all of you for your attention. And you can set the ball rolling with the other presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mashoud, for your presentation and uh, your good overview about the uh, uh, groundwater program. Um, before we continue, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, the participants have the opportunity to write, chat and ask questions. Uh, and we will choose some of these questions at the end of the session and uh, um, open the floor for very short discussion. Um, yeah, as we have seen in Moshut's uh, presentation, uh, so the, the overall aim of the program is to support uh, sustainable use of groundwater resources to unlock the potential that groundwater has for the African continent. Um, our next speaker, Seifu Kebede, uh, professor for hydro, hydrology at the KwaZulu Natal University in South Africa, will talk about the potential of groundwater, but also on the bottleneck. Uh, Unlock this potential. Seifu, please uh, start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Romo. Yes, yeah, so this is the outline of my talk uh, briefly about groundwater in Africa, the different bottlenecks, and key messages. Next slide, please. Africa is endowed with groundwater resources. Uh, this landmark paper by Alan McDonald in 2012 demonstrated that quantitatively demonstrated that uh, groundwater is, uh, you know, Africa is sitting on large groundwater reserve, you know, compared to its uh, fresh uh, renewable ground uh, resources. Next slide, please. And in the future also under climate change, uh, groundwater is uh, proven to be uh, the most resilient water resources. This work by Cuthbert 2019 demonstrate because of the nature of the aquifers and how the aquifers get recharged, mainly by episodic rainfall, future climate change, under future climate change scenario, uh, we expect more groundwater recharge. This is a landmark paper, uh, again, by uh, Cuthbert 2019. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, groundwater use, I'll talk from the perspective of food production in, in my, my uh, bottleneck analysis. So from the point of uh, food production, uh, there is only incipient stage you know, use of groundwater for, for irrigation, less than 1%, groundwater contributes less than 1% of uh, irrigation activities in Africa. But uh, there are some regions uh, like in the Nile Valley, for instance, in Egypt and Sudan, 
whereby hundreds of thousands of hectares are being irrigated using groundwater uh, as a conjunctive uh, with, uh, with surface water resources. This is an intro report uh, recently published in 2000, uh, the produced uh, 2019. But elsewhere, it is incipient. And next slide, please. And the kind of, uh, you know, thriving farmers driving small scale supplementary irrigation is yet to start in Africa. We don't see these images from Southeast Asia, and we don't see that kind of uh, thriving irrigation practices based on groundwater in Africa. And what are the bottlenecks? Next slide. When we look Africa in many regards over the last 50 years and the practices of groundwater assessment, development, management, monitoring, and the key issues, Africa stands alone in many regards, meaning that, for instance, when elsewhere, computer applications, model predictions, automatic monitoring, handheld tools, or local management uh, solutions are implemented and national databases are composed, Africa was not doing that. And it's only in year 2020 that Africa recognized the strategic importance of groundwater. And it is now, for instance, in the you know, main a portfolio of uh, AMCAO. And the bottleneck is therefore, its lack of, will be challenged by, by lack of empirical evidence originating from within Africa to pinpoint what are the real actual bottlenecks that brings about large leverage. So next slide, please. And then, but learning from global experiences and the patchy evidences from within Africa, we can say, there are two main layers of bottlenecks, the low level ones and the high level ones. But before mentioning what these bottlenecks are, let me start with the methodological challenge. Paucity of empirical evidence in Africa and multiple bottlenecks, the, liber of, the leverage of which is hard to say a priori. There is a methodological challenge, but nevertheless, uh, let me mention some of the, the bottlenecks like knowledge and information, technology, economics, and financing, low level uh, liveries. Knowledge and information is growing. And also in some cases, farmers can utilize, you know, learning by doing practices. And then uh, maybe that is not very high leverage uh, point. And then technology is also being increasingly available given that there is sufficient finance to purchase the technology. Technology is increasingly available call it access technology to access the groundwater or lifting technology or uh, whatever. And uh, then economics is also not a big issue nowadays because of population increase, urbanization, there is large demand for food and market is out there for food, food producers. And I would say the finance is the main problem, the main issue when you look at lower level, at farm level, access to finance, by farmers to purchase technologies, to purchase information, to purchase agricultural input, et cetera. And the high level ones are like capacity of institutions to self-reflect, to monitor and evaluate, and then identify gaps and, and improve on that. And the political economy is also very important, but uh, the way, where this depends on the global policy cycles. You know, Sometimes there is focus on uh, smallholders, other times there is focus on agricultural mechanization, and Africa is impacted by these global policy cycles, and we are sitting in this umbrella. So uh, next slide, please. And then sometimes the bottlenecks of highest leverage are the least obvious. An example from the wash sector, for instance, uh, an empirical exercise whereby samples have been sent to laboratories, water laboratories, to check performance of the laboratories. And then what institutional condition affects the, uh, the performance? Financing, for instance, if you ask the question, is there a specific budget for water quality monitoring? The presence of budget, it looks obvious. And yes, it, it, it relates to performance. But in reality, in that empirical evidence, presence of budget didn't affect the outcome of the performance of laboratories. So that is, there is this methodological challenge because of the lack of experience over the last 40, 50 years in, in Africa. Next slide, please. For instance, in, in, in Ethiopia recently, knowledge and information is identified as the main bottleneck to kickstart small-scale irrigation development. And then 
large investment has been put in mapping groundwater resources. 200,000 hectares of uh, kilometer square of land has been mapped for shallow groundwater. But during the same period of time, there was no commensurate increase in groundwater irrigation. And the groundwater use expanded rapidly. Where it expanded rapidly, it was because of farmers learning from each other. Example, production of cat, which is a stimulant plant, being introduced in northern uh, Ethiopia. And that was introduced by farmers and then rapidly scaled up because of farmers learning from each other. Next slide, please. So what are the two major bottlenecks? I'll put them in uh, like capacity and financing. When I say capacities, the capacity of the institutions, the countries, the member states in this case, to think analytically, to strategize, and institutions' capacity for mainstreaming of cross-cutting issues like energy, climate change, technologies, financing, nutrition, gender, and the capacities of the institutions to coordinate and integrating diverse activities, projects, and programs, and the capacities of the institutions for evaluation and learning. So that is a major bottleneck, institutional bottleneck. So the capacity of the institutions to transform and financing, particularly at a lower level at farm level is uh, the major, two major gaps. So groundwater is an element among ocean of other elements in an already constrained agriculture sector. Therefore, to leverage the use of groundwater, we need to see holistically economics, finance, land tenure, farming, contractual farming, markets, value chains, agricultural extension, private sector, agribusinesses, input. So groundwater or agriculture is not a new sector in Africa and groundwater must see itself where it falls in the agriculture sector. To do this, the starting point may be mainstreaming groundwater into ongoing national projects and programs. Example, agricultural growth prog programs, fisheries programs, et cetera. Next slide, please. So the key message here is that we need two things. The first is a framework at country level. Where are we standing now? And what is that we want to achieve? And what are the gaps? This is a framework, uh, the, the thing you see, the picture you see here is uh, taken from GWMATE, a uh, group of consultants for the World Bank. And this has been practiced, exercised in uh, uh, like 10 years ago. And where are we standing now? Where are we heading? And what are the gaps in policy, regulatory capacity, institutional arrangement, information, and financing? Identify three for each country, for each region, and then prioritize them. But this is again hypothetical in a sense that we don't know whether that gap, if filled, would transform. Therefore, we need a continuous engagement, long-term engagement beyond the policy cycles of five or 10 years. So that is where we need the capacity of the institutions to able to transform the, the sector. And secondly, at farm level, at, you know, at lower level, at grassroots level, farmers need to access, market is no more an issue, I would say, but farmers need to have access to finance, to buy technologies, to buy information, and to buy inputs and uh, produce and use groundwater to leverage uh, their own life and the lives of uh, the others. So thank you very much, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Seibu, for your far-reaching overview um, about the low and high level bottlenecks. Um, I think the program will uh, very much orientate on these bottlenecks uh, for the activities. Um, uh, let me, uh, I forgot to mention um, for the chat um, that uh, uh, to raise questions to you, please the part that will chat box. Um, so uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, so uh, our next uh, presentation uh, is about uh, management, which is in that case, uh, usually we talk about locally managed resources, which is mainly the case for shallow groundwater. But if we have deep and vast uh, uh, groundwater aquifers, then uh, there is a need to manage groundwater resources transboundary. 
And uh, our next speaker, Christina Fraser, she is from the uh, International Groundwater Assessment Center. She will give us an introduction into uh, yeah, transboundary aquifer management and uh, yeah, the, maybe the next steps and uh, the future of kind of management. Please, uh, Christina, um, we are uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, you can just move to the first slide, please. So for some context, a transboundary aquifer is an aquifer or aquifer system, part of which are situated in different states. Transboundary aquifers therefore um, are shared groundwater resources and they have the potential to transfer groundwater from one country to another. Slide please. This means that the actions on one side of the border within a transboundary aquifer can have impacts for the other side. For example, impacts can include a reduction of groundwater levels within the aquifer caused by unsustainable abstraction, changes in flow patterns, contamination of the groundwater, and impacts for other hydraulically connected systems, such as rivers, lakes, or ecosystems. Ultimately, this can lead to tension and conflict if not addressed. Globally, there are over 366 transboundary aquifers currently identified, and there are 72 currently mapped across Africa that have been identified and refined over decades of global um, and regional initiatives and studies. Slide, please. Transboundary aquifers represent around 42% of the continental area across Africa, and most of these aquifers are high storage and high yielding, and therefore important for groundwater development. Despite nearly half a century of activities in Africa, only 25% of TBAs have been studied in detail. Many TBAs are also only delineated and assessed on a regional scale, not considering the detail at the more local level, where communities near borders might rely exclusively on transboundary groundwater. Often connections between TBAs and surface waters are poorly understood, as well as their recharge and discharge mechanisms. The rate of flow of groundwater across international borders is often also poorly conceptualized. A lack of groundwater monitoring in many countries also means that we likely don't know of issues that already exist within these transboundary aquifers, such as depleting water levels or low water quality. This is then exacerbated by limited availability of data, financing and capacity across many parts of the continent. Slide please. When we look at past transboundary aquifer studies across Africa, most are located in semi-arid and arid regions, indicating that assessments seem to be primarily driven by water scarcity issues. Of the 13 TBAs that have had some form of research or assessment undertaken on them, nine are reported to have some form of governance framework in place or in preparation. However, only two transboundary aquifer specific agreements exist across the entire of Africa. So progress is slow in the management of these aquifers. So how can we move towards more sustainable management of these transboundary aquifers? Well, the inclusion of transboundary water cooperation within the sustainability development goals, specifically through target indicator 6.5.2, was a major step forward in highlighting the importance of cooperation. And even just the exercise of reporting on indicator progress is beneficial as it prompts countries to look at what their actual transboundary situation is and it supports the formation of operational arrangements. Encouraging river basin organizations across Africa to include groundwater within their scope um, where practical is also recommended, as these organizations are already set up to deal with transboundary surface water management. A recent success story being the Stamprete Aquifer system, where countries agreed to establish a cooperation mechanism 
of the aquifer nested within the structure of the Orassicom River Basin. This agreement supports groundwater data collection and exchange between the countries sharing the aquifer. In general, we also need to be better at communicating the benefits of cooperation and management within these aquifers, as well as the importance of groundwater in general across the continent. Recently, the concept of prioritization and zoning within transboundary aquifers has been gaining, gaining more momentum. Often transboundary issues manifest in zones of impact close to the border and at a scale that um, is smaller than the entire aquifer. In these cases, it might be better to identify and focus on key hotspots within the transboundary aquifer that can be prior prioritized for more directed management and policy. Slide, please. When we think about prioritization, we need to consider what are the main concerns and pressures within the TBA? Where do we want to direct our resources? And are there certain areas within the aquifer that might require more immediate attention than others? This might include examining the aquifer for water quality hotspots and areas of high abstraction rate, like in the example from Malawi on the right, or defining management and protection zones along the border, as was done for the Al Sag Al DC aquifer shared between Jordan and Saudi Arabia on the left. Once we know where and what the problems are, we can then use the more conventional management tools like conjunctive water use, MAR, monitoring networks and abstraction licenses to manage the resource more appropriately at an appropriate scale. Slide, please. So just to conclude, Moving forward, we need to encourage countries across Africa to report on their transboundary cooperation progress under SDG 6 and to take advantage of the current momentum around transboundary cooperation triggered by the SDGs. We need to highlight benefits of cooperation and we need to support groundwater monitoring, data collection and sharing across the continent. Prioritization and zoning within transboundary aquifers is emerging as a key tool to support management, but we need to develop guidelines for countries on how to best use these techniques in practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation and your introduction to transboundary aquifer management. Uh, yeah, I think it's quite a challenge to introduce that uh, uh, worldwide, uh, especially also in Africa but necessary to prevent conflicts and, uh, uh, as you said already, to increase the benefits uh, from cooperation. Such a, a benefit from cooperation is not only the case in transboundary aquifer management, it's also the case in local uh, groundwater resources. And uh, uh, um, yeah, so we are now going from the international scale into the local scale or the national scale and uh, to look uh, in the, um, in the, the economical and the social potential uh, of these resources, uh, which might be depleted in some cases, but in other cases, not even exhausted. BGR's ex uh, engagement uh, within the program is to finance pilots uh, um, for a number of countries. Um, to show value and gaining experiences and learning lessons. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, we could present here recently two of these pilots and we will start with Bertrand Swartz from the Ministry of Agriculture, Water, Forestry and Media. Um, they are currently um, in a, I would say it's a process uh, of a dialogue um, process in the water sector with neighboring sectors and uh, which aims to unlock the potential of, uh, of Namibia's groundwater resources for social and economic development. Please, Bertram, the floor is Thank you, Ramon, and good afternoon, participants. Um, Ramon, thank you for the introduction. We can move to the next slide. Groundwater resources are of great environmental, social, and uh, economic significance. 
investment in groundwater development and management will positively impact key economic sectors such as domestic water supply, mining, agriculture, while supporting livelihoods and providing economic opportunities for, for the people in Namibia. This is a message from the Minister of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform, the recent statement, Honorable Schlettwein. Next slide, please. So we've, with Namibia being uh, the driest country sub, south of the, um, of the Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with many or all perennial rivers found along the borders with neighboring countries. That's a shared resource, as was previously alluded to, and the damming of ephemeral rivers within the interior of the country, relying on, on sparse and erratic rainfall. Groundwater that, that seems to be the most reliable source of supply for potable water in the country. So to echo statements by our minister, groundwater already supports a wide array of economic environmental activities. Only 7% of the renewable water is currently used. And this indicates uh, still a large potential for further economic development. Right. When, when we're looking at the, at the EPIGROP program, and it was alluded to earlier, the African Minister's Council on Water in 2018 launched or introduced this Pan-African Groundwater Program, which was in subsequently in 2020 launched in, in Uganda. The, it was in a response by request from the African the AMCO ministers to revitalize efforts on groundwater to accelerate the impact of of Africa, of groundwater for Africa and, and water security. The program aims to support the AMCO member states in their endeavors to improve groundwater management as a means of improving the livelihood of the citizen. Therefore, the APOGROP program developed a, a groundwater country support tool, and I will be referring to it as the CST, that aligns national development aspirations with sustainable groundwater development and management. And this is being currently piloted in Namibia. Next slide, please. So where we are and what the CST in Namibia is currently uh, doing and where we are, is the CST supports Namibia in, in this task with a coherent and participatory process to, to diagnose, plan and implement actions in a, in a phased approach, phase one, two, and three. It mobilizes partners to support the enabling environment and provides investment requirements to move the country towards a desired future state. So an inclusive approach is necessary for the necessary development of groundwater resources with contributions not only from the state, but also from non-state actors, such as the private sector, civil society, academia, uh, and especially international cooperating partners. So the CST brings um, inline sustainable groundwater development management within the national development aspiration. So where, where the country is going. Next slide, please. So the, the progress that has been made, and um, you must know that we, we are all in the same situation all in the same boat, the COVID pandemic, but progress has been made. So some restrictions, some planning was done, but there were some restrictions um, on, on carrying out these, these um, different uh, phased approaches. But phase one, the profiling of groundwater and its, its contributions to development. This diagnostic phase of the CSD focused especially on analyzing the role of groundwater and its potentials for socioeconomic development. This assessment characterized by an inclusive consultative process that involved various stakeholders inside and outside the water sector. So different nexuses, policymakers, uh, practitioners, academia, consultants, and, and through a, a review of what is currently on the ground, policy documents, and national development goals. This is the first throughout the, throughout the first phase. Um, the second the second phase of 
of this, and this is where the challenges came, came forth, um, where you put the diagnostics into action planning, you were not able to target stakeholders specifically, um, but you had to make view with what you had. The CST webinars that we, we carried out targeted stakeholders consulting, uh, consulted during the, the first analysis phase into a broader audience, as well as actors from international development corporations were involved, the African water, water sector, in order to include them in, into this. It's quite challenging. Um, we're, we're currently moving into a more um, action planned and resource mobilization phase, which is the third phase, where the groundwater CST will be led, which will be led by the, the, the ministry responsible for water, um, with the support from national focal groups on groundwater, which is established by SADIC, SADIC um, GMI. Um, under this phase, there are key ta tasks that will include the development of an action plan, and that, that will move us into a spell out what is the desired future, future state. So firstly, it intends to see the CSD action plan um, used. Maybe we are only using more or less 7% where is it that we want to go and and also um, secondly we want to look at groundwater development and management positively transform the lives and livelihoods of namibians next slide please so so in in conclusion um the C cst pilot project is expected to provide essentially a tool that can be used by various stakeholders so a go-to tool um, that stakeholders and decision makers can use to inform them about the potentials of developing infrastructure, how policy reforms work, the, the knowledge and data management, as well as the management and governance of groundwater. These, this, this pilot project um, is and will continue to be well documented at every, every section, every uh, sector, every juncture, in order for the tool to be adapted and replicated in other member states of AMCAO and through throughout the APOGROP project. So, oh, APOGROP program. So um, it's important that Namibia sort of does well and, and learns from this and so that APOGROP can, can do this. I, I think this is more or less it. I thank um, uh, BGR and, and Siwi and also AMCAO for, for giving me this opportunity and, and for Namibia to have this opportunity to pilot. Thank you, over to you, Ramon. Thank you, Berra, for your good uh, insight of this dialogue process. I think which is unique is that uh, development aspirations go in line with the water uh, sector needs and, and uh, potentials. Um, I think it's not only a transparent dialogue and decision-making process. Um, um, on one hand, it should also attract financial resources, which was identified also uh, in the first presentation or the second presentation by SEFU as one of the bottlenecks. And our next presentation is uh, about the connection between groundwater and climate, which is, I would say, was more or less neglected in, in the past. Uh, so groundwater and finance but never came really together. And I hope we broke this ice and uh, could first uh, bring some light into the Dark Shadow, and uh, I'm happy to introduce Dimitri Kotseyev from the United Nations Development Capital Fund um, to um, present, um, I would say, a case study from Uganda, which should expand to other countries later to see um, the principles and uh, uh, the actors within this uh, sector. Please, uh, Dimitri, um, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, for this introduction, Ramon, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, so I will, uh, together with uh, my colleague Yusuf Kivala, uh, associate professor at McMurray University, uh, we will talk to you about a new exciting initiative on financing uh, groundwater um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, next slide, please. This is implemented through the Groundwater Finance Initiative. The objective of this initiative is to develop a framework for groundwater financing 
uh, that would involve uh, the guiding principles, uh, drivers, enables, as well as good practices for groundwater finance at the local level in particular to ensure sustainable financing of groundwater management and utilization. But our ambition is also to design a methodology, kind of a self-diagnostic that uh, can be used by both at the national level and at the local level to take a deep dive into the issue of uh, groundwater finance. This assessment takes uh, an ecosystem approach uh, and uh, it will, it will involve uh, uh, a number of uh, um, activities. As you could see from the, in the previous slide, uh, there were a number of uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, we are very uh, happy to have uh, BGR with us, uh, uh, as well as uh, a number of other partners working in the framework of that initiative. I would also like to say a few words uh, before handing over to Yusuf. I would like to say a few words about the ecosystem approach. So the um, uh, uh, initiative uh, takes uh, uh, groundwater finance uh, as a holistic issue. And the three basic uh, uh, dimensions of the ecosystem include actors, sources of finance, as well as financing structure. The actors of finance are multiple. Uh, they involve regulators, they uh, involve, of course, financiers, um, producers, uh, national, local governments, regional and uh, international uh, development finance agencies. And the um, important challenge uh, that we are facing now, and the last presentation also mentioned uh, uh, the issue of resource mobilization, is how we can apply development finance in a way to leverage and mobilize private capital uh, for uh, supporting groundwater finance. Uh, there are different uh, financing structures that may be used. Uh, it includes microfinance, concessional finance, and conditional grants, unconditional grants, pure uh, public finance, of course, is also there. And depending on uh, the groundwater value chain, which extends from um, exploration, uh, research, development, exploitation, as well as uh, operation and maintenance, different sources of finance uh, will be required. And we need to have in mind that uh, the different activities along the value chain uh, also assume different types of financing. That should come with um, uh, understanding the economies of scale in each particular case. And that requires developing uh, relevant capacities, not only in uh, local and uh, national governments, but also in financiers, which still believe uh, that groundwater finance uh, is not a particularly appropriate um, uh, area of finance or investment class, if you wish, and that it carries significant uh, risks. Now over to my colleague, uh, Yusuf Kivala to talk about the uh, challenges and opportunities. Yes, thank you, Dimitri. Um, our initial preliminary diagnosis uh, shows that uh, regarding uh, the regulations for groundwater in Uganda, it's a give and take. There are opportunities that regulations present, but also they are binding uh, challenges at the moment. Uh, we also see the aspect of risk on the part of the financial but also we see the aspect of risk perceptions on the side of the users of groundwater, including small scale farmers and also artisans who provide such water at local level. We see uh, both opportunity for decentralization, but also at the moment, there are funding constraints regarding groundwater financing, especially the management aspect at local level. We also see already the affordability constraints on the side of farmers who use groundwater for irrigation, but also at institutional level, uh, city level, and also local government level, the issue of capacity of developing bankable projects, which can be presented to financiers to, to, to access finances. But also the other aspect in our initial diagnosis is the aspect of tools and data, monitoring data, but also instruments for analyzing financial viability, viabilities of investments in groundwater. 
This is the preliminary um, analysis or diagnostic of the constraint. Now, the constraint presents, uh, the diagnosis presents opportunities. Already we see that uh, we cannot come to common, um, come into a common financing uh, framework uh, requires the diagnosis of the legal and the regulatory framework, but also the governance arrangement. But we already see that this presents opportunity as previously, especially for bulk users, but also, uh, as I said, um, um, there should be innovative, uh, rather they are already innovative uh, um, uh, physical measures that make private investment feasible. We have seen this in the road infrastructure, the, the, the listing in the road infrastructure investment already happening in Uganda. We think the same idea of thinking can come to the groundwater perspective. We also see that the aspect of the decentralization of, of, of implementation of groundwater development activity presents opportunities in terms of uh, this autonomous local government being able to present or attract financials both globally on their own um, uh, and also regionally. We also see that in some parts of Uganda already, the, the, the demand for groundwater use is enormous. And we also see the options, the options in cities, especially Kampala and other large cities of bulk users. And that also presents opportunities for the consumption uh, or tradable, uh, for a tradable permit scheme for groundwater. And then we also see, given the constraints of instrument, the opportunity to develop a common financing framework, looking at the responsibilities and roles of, of various actors and what they are financing, because looking at the value chain already, we see some aspects of value chains are well-funded and, and others are not well-funded. So there's a financing gap there. So uh, uh, next slide. So th thank you very much. So we, we think um, um, already that um, uh, the analysis, the initial diagnosis presents opportunities for designing a common framework where different contributors or actors are already involved, but also uh, knowing their roles and where they can put emphasis uh, through a, a common design financing strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yusuf and Dimitri, and uh, thank you for the cook who reminds me that we have had already our last presentation. Um, now we uh, will have a short wrap up uh, with Paul Rengo is around now uh, because I couldn't see yet. Paul, are you here? If, if that is not the case, I ask uh, Moshut to take over his place and uh, to uh, wrap up uh, the session and uh, to give a call for action. Yeah, thank you, uh, Raymond. And I want to appreciate all of us for being part of this uh, event today, our speakers and uh, presenters, as well as the, the participants who are greatly done us a great honor for being part of this program. Uh, as a form of wrap up, I, I think the reality is clearly that uh, improved groundwater management and governance is central to fully realizing sustainable development goal related to water security, food security, and resilience in Africa. And in this respect, the call for action is that there will be need for, to strengthen the understanding of the link between policy development of governance tools in groundwater sector in Africa. Secondly, we also have to know that due to the critical roles of groundwater in the future resilience of people, environment, economies of Africa, warrant that AMCO to spearhead the continental platform for long-term sustainable groundwater development. So there's no doubt about it that in this case, there should be the need to support AMCO for an African groundwater program to enhance information, data, knowledge base for effective groundwater management governments in member states. Also, as part of our up, we also need to state clearly here from the all the foregoing that there is no matching investment in groundwater resources development in Africa. The investment is really limited. 
compared to other climbs. And despite the increasing multiplicity of groundwater use for domestic holders, irrigation, and industrial usage as well as ever. So, therefore, there is also the need to call for partnership and collaboration with AMCO partners in this drive for institution and human capacity development in groundwater management and governance in Africa. And finally, we have to realize that despite the enormous potential of groundwater in supporting social economic development in Africa, there is also little or no matching investment in groundwater resources development. And that is why the last part of our presentation is focusing on the need to understand the financing structure of groundwater resources in Africa and how we can uh, have a kind of combination of public and private investment to be deployed into groundwater resources development in Africa. These are the targets, these are the focus of the uh, upper group and the groundwater program of AMCO. And on this note, I want to say that uh, your cooperation, your support, and international support for us to achieve this goal is very critical. Once again, I thank all of us for being part of this program. Over to you, Orlando Raymond. Thank you, Moshut, uh, for the wrap up and your call of actions. So um, I'm very impressed of the discipline of each speaker. We They all stick to the time that gives us an additional four minutes um, to, um, uh, to um, answer questions that were raised in the chat box. And I already, I like also the first question here is, uh, how could AMCAO's objectives be achieved considering the peculiarities across different African states. Um, I think Moshoud, I would have asked that uh, uh, Paul, I think, but I think he was a groundwater gas manager should be also able to answer that question, Moshoud. What uh, do you think? How yeah, that I, I, I wouldn't know whether I got the question very well, but uh, we know there are a lot of challenges in achieving the objective of the upper group. So looking at the African context and a lot of information that are needed. But uh, I think the key function and the role that AMCO want to play is to be able to overcome those challenges that will habilitate against achieving this laudable goal because there is no two way about it. Groundwater resources is key for the future development of African continent, be it in agriculture, water security for domestic industrial use. So, Part of these challenges that is mentioned is what the AMCO program is set to address by trying to leverage on both science and technology in achieving sustainable development of groundwater resources in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mashut. And may I add that I think the program offers tools that helps each member countries and supports the member countries in managing their uh, uh, the water resources. Um, I think two tools we presented today. There are several more tools. I know that chart. Yeah, yeah. There, there are more tools that are coming, and that is what AMCO is trying to do. But in, in within this framework, we need the capacity development. We need some programs of action to develop some guidelines, policy guidelines, institutional guidelines, and all the rest. These are the part of the component of the upper group project. And, uh, and as I said, institutional support, collaboration is needed to develop those guidelines. And it is those guidelines and tools, part of which is presented in the last two uh, presentations, is what we need. And there are many more that we are going to develop at AMCO level to be able to, to, to help the member state in achieving the sustainable development goal. But as I said, the political commitment and will of the member state is also critical for the success of that. Thank you. Thank you, Moshut. Uh, and we have uh, another question, which will be also the last question for today, is uh, on financing. Um, the question was raised before the last presentation came, but uh, um, I will give it to Dimitri and to Yusuf. Um, the question is uh, um, on financing, especially one for the monitoring. What solution for financing can be considered, considered outside of government funding? Can you please repeat this, Ramon? I didn't quite get the question. Um, what solutions for financing could be considered outside of government funding? 
especially the, was the focus on groundwater monitoring? Well, uh, one obvious uh, solution is uh, relying more on, uh, on, on private finance. But for this, we would need to make uh, groundwater projects investable. And it's, um, and, uh, it's uh, there are, of course, projects that will have to be funded by uh, public budgets because they create the so-called pure public goods. And it's inevitable. But there are also quite a few projects, particularly when groundwater is used for production, which uh, can be commercially sustainable, at least economically sustainable. So identifying such projects and uh, developing a um, financial support uh, ecosystem that also involves businesses and uh, uh, private sector financiers, uh, including impact investors, for example, uh, this is a heavily um, underutilized source of finance in groundwater financing uh, will uh, uh, result hopefully in the significant increase in the uh, volume of uh, finance available. Over. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, I think that was the last uh, part of the uh, this session. Uh, here with I will close the session. I will thank, uh, say thank you to our speakers um, that participated here in the and I say thank you to uh, the technical team that supported uh, uh, this uh, session today. And also last but not least, also all participants to listen on this program. And uh, I hope we could uh, uh, engage uh, one or more, uh, a few more actors in uh, yeah, engaging in this program. And uh, we are looking forward for uh, getting a broader network of, of actors here in the groundwater network. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye.